Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's an honor to be here at the Healthcare Project Delivery Conference 2021. This is a great opportunity for me to share about a process that will help bring your projects in on time and on budget. My name is Elizabeth Tippin, and I'm an attorney, a mediator, and a dispute board practitioner um, based in San Francisco. I'm president of the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation Region 1, which is California, uh, Canada, and the Caribbean. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering the use of dispute boards around the world. Well, I'm here to share my knowledge about using dispute boards um, on construction projects. So what is a dispute board? A dispute board is also known as a dispute resolution board or a dispute review board. It is a panel of impartial professionals, typically one to three people, a combination of engineers, architects, and construction attorneys or neutrals. This panel, dispute board panel, is selected at the beginning of a construction of a project to follow the progress of the construction which means meeting regularly at the project with the owner and the general contractor representatives every month, or as often as the parties agree, combined with a site visit to view the status of the construction. The process is flexible to meet the needs of the project. And with flexibility, I mean during COVID-19, as construction moved forward on projects, dispute boards continued to regularly meet um, using Zoom and other platforms along with site visits that were done via, via uh, videos, photographs, or even drone videos. The goal of a dispute board is to encourage dispute prevention and avoidance by proactively discussing with the parties issues that come up during the project and to assist in the resolution of disputes by providing informal opinions regarding potential issues or formal written opinions to resolve disputes. So we're going to go in a little bit more deeply on this broad definition of what, of a, what is a dispute board and look at some uh, projects that have used, successfully used or unsuccessfully used uh, dispute boards. Thank you. So the goal of a dispute board is to encourage dispute prevention and avoidance during while the project's ongoing by proactively discussing the project's issues as they come up and to assist in the resolution of disputes by providing in, informal opinions regarding the process and formal opinions. They're engaged in the entire project um, resolving issues real time as the project progresses, preserving relationships, money that could be used for uh, litigation typically is not budgeted in the project. But when you use a dispute board, you're gonna resolve so many issues, almost all of the issues while the project is ongoing that that money that wasn't allocated for litigation can be used for new projects. Dispute boards first started in about 1976, and it was created by the um, tunneling industry, who initiated a study. And this study talked about what is the cause, the focus of the study was to find out what is the cause of the rapidly escalating construction costs. And what they found out was that the, the, the costs were really increasing by as a result of disputes and resulting litigation. In 1976, the first dispute board concept, which was created by these engineers, was first used on the Eisenhower Tunnel of the I-70 um, in Colorado. Compared to litigation, which took a lot of years after the project was completed and cost a lot of money, resolving issues while the project was ongoing was a resounding success. So 
As dispute boards started um, being used around the world in 1995, the World Bank made that process mandatory on all projects that they were financing infrastructure. Um, other banks followed suit. Different organizations started developing form contracts like the FIDIG form contracts that were um, calling for dispute boards. The Dispute Resolution Board Foundation was established. And in 2010, there was kind of a shift, a major shift, which was instead of just resolving disputes while the project is ongoing, the dispute board got more actively involved in the project to actually prevent and avoid disputes by proactively talking about them. I'm showing you um, the ADR continuum. So this continuum compares dispute boards with other forms of dispute res resolution. The red zone, going all the way to a jury trial, 12 people who don't want to be sitting there, who don't have technical abilities um, or interest in the project. Um, litigation, arbitration really is the place where you don't want to be. You don't want to be to that red point. It's high cost. It takes a lot of time to get to that point. Where you want to be is in the green zone. The green zone is resolving disputes while the project is ongoing. It takes less costs. It takes no time. The project will be completed on time and on budget. So I'm showing you a project right now that um, is uh, the Seattle Aquarium Pier 59 renovation project by Methune Architects. And uh, the, the construction contractor was Turner Construction. So what types of projects, you know, use dispute boards? Um, I'm showing you right here a vertical project which is um, a, you know, an aquarium project. Dispute boards are used typically on public and private projects, um, heavy civil water and wastewater, dams and energy airports, highways, bridges, tunnels, transit, ports, any type of project can use a dispute board. So here is the Martin Stadium Southside Renovation Project in Pullman, Washington. It's a Washington State University project, which is um, Washington State has embraced using dispute boards on all of their projects. So let's face it, all construction is complex and high risk. Today, um, dispute boards are used on complex sites, lengthy duration, high risk, and a variety of project delivery methods. So not only stadium projects, you know, vertical construction projects, highway projects, they're used on a variety of projects. Here's a map showing you dispute boards around the world. Um, they are utilized, United States, Canada, all the places where it's red, uh, South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, Indonesia, they're all using dispute boards to resolve conflict while the project is ongoing. So here is um, a, another vertical construction project. It is the Talking Stick Resort Arena in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was an LRB Beckett project. The project used a three member dispute board and so how do you choose, you know, one of the most important aspects is choosing this um, dispute board. How do you choose this board of impartial professionals? And what you're looking for is, first of all, at the beginning of the project, both the owner and the contractor jointly select the parties that are going to be members of this dispute board. They're looking for industry professionals somebody who's neutral to all parties, experienced in that type of construction, experienced with that project delivery method, and experienced with dispute avoidance and uh, resolution process. So the selection of who's going to be on this dispute board is one of the very important aspects of the project. 
So the dispute panel, and I'm showing you right now a picture of the San Francisco Central Subway, um, which is a picture taken during the construction by myself um, of this project. So what you're looking for in this dispute board panel is people who are experienced with interpretation of contract documents. A lot of times the disputes that come up are, you know, is this included in the contract or is it not included? You want people who really have the ability to analyze the disputes and you want people who are good at writing reports that are clear, concise and logical. You want people who are trained in the dispute board process. You don't want necessarily arbitrators and mediators who are going to, you know, proactively wait and issue their opinion, you know, every time there's an issue um, to actively work with the parties to resolve disputes. What you want are people who are going to be trained in the dispute board process, which is a bit different than arbitration and mediation. Certainly people who are trained in arbitration and mediation and the dispute board process are in a great position to, um, to be great members of a dispute board. You also want somebody who's committed to a code of ethical conduct. There are a lot of organizations, including Caltrans, um, for instance, in California, the Department of Transportation, who have embodied the DRBF code of ethics into their contract. So you want people that are committed to a code of ethical conduct. It's very important um, not to have private conversations with one side or the other side, to remain neutral um, and uh, you know other code of ethical conduct issues. I'm not gonna go through them, but you can review the code of ethical conduct um, on the dispute board website, which I'm going to tell you about a little bit later on as we're talking. So I'm showing you um, the Spokane Arena, which um, was designed by ALSC Architects. It had a three-member DRB. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how does this actual DRB work? You know, the contract and the specifications, first of all, require a dispute board. So it's part of the, the specifications and the contract that's really defined typically by the owner at the beginning of the project. It's part of the dispute process that's going to be available. You know, whether it's partnering, dispute boards, arbitration, mediation, litigation, it's all part of the project at the very beginning or when you're first designing the, the project and the contract as to how that process is going to be, how that process is going to work. So the dispute board is actually organized when the work begins and we call that a standing board. They are working from the beginning of the project before there's any disputes. You call it kind of the honeymoon period. You know, the owner, the contractor are getting along really well. Everybody is collaborating. You want the dispute board to start at that time period. So one of the first things that the dispute board does is they get all of the project documents. They actually have a kickoff meeting with the parties. And at that meeting, there's a proposed operating procedures that is presented. The operating procedures is a method of um, specifics of how the dispute board is going to operate on that project. It's something that both the owner, the contractor representatives, and the dispute board all discuss and work with each other on how that's going to be, work. Are they going to meet monthly? Are they going to meet quarterly? You know, what is regular? Um, I'll just say with Caltrans, there is a minimum requirement that they meet quarterly as the project progresses. If it's a three-year project, you're going to see quarterly meetings. You know, for some projects, especially vertical construction projects like this Spokane Arena, they met on a monthly basis because as the construction is, is um, rising, um, there were issues that came up every month that the dispute board would um, have a meeting with the parties, would do a site visit, would look at, you know, change orders, um, 
RFIs, you know, what's the log, you know, how is the project progressing? So the dispute board really stays up to date with what's going on with uh, the um, issues. So they review project documents and they conduct a site visit. So the dispute board is up to date on the project. So what the dispute board participates in is really avoidance of disputes and the resolution of disputes. We're going to look a little more closely at what these are. This is a picture um, that I took of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. The Bay Bridge um, had a dispute board, a three party dispute board that resolved conflict um, while the project was ongoing in dispute avoidance and assisted with specific resolution of issues that came up that weren't avoided but became issues that the parties wanted to, to hear. Um, I was on a DRB for the east end of the goal of the Bay Bridge um, renovation project. All of the different 580, 880, 80 that comes into the Bay Bridge um, renovation project, three year project. We had a three party dispute board that met regularly every quarter. And that dispute board um, resolved issues in dispute avoidance. As the project continued at the end of the project, there were no formal hearings and the project finished on time and under budget. So I'm showing you here the Spokane Convention Center expansion project, which used one project neutral. So, you know, we've talked about that dispute boards can be one or three people. And uh, this particular project used a um, one person dispute avoidance technique. So the dispute avoidance here is proactively working with the parties to identify issues as they come up at those monthly meetings for this project and resolve those before they became disputes so that at the end of the project, there were no disputes to be resolved. So this is the Seattle World Trade Center project, um, which was a Port of Seattle project with the architect was um, Zimmer Gunsell Frasca Architects and used a three person DRB. So I wanna talk a little bit about what is the dispute resolution process? Um, dispute resolution can actually come in a couple of different forms. First of all, if both parties agree, the owner and the contractor, um, they can have <clears throat> an inform, they can request that the DRB render an informal opinion. This is typically scheduled at one of the regular monthly or quarterly meetings of the dispute board that both parties, the owner and the contractor will present an issue and the dispute board will retire. They will discuss the issue amongst them. They'll come back and they'll give an informal opinion regarding which party should actually um, win on that issue. And it's not really a win, you know, it may be um, a merit issue, not a quantum issue or a merit and a quantum issue that comes up, but they give an informal opinion and their reasoning, and there's a discussion between the parties. Why do you feel that way? This gives the owner and the contractor an opportunity to go off and to actually continue their negotiation discussions um, and resolve the issue. Most of the time, that informal opinion resolves the issue. There is another process, which is that the dispute board can conduct a formal hearing and they write a comprehensive opinion. So this formal um, opinion um, will usually be scheduled at a, a separate meeting with the dispute board and the parties. Um, for instance, uh, one thing is that there's typically no attorneys at any of these meetings but that can be discussed between the parties. It's really the real people at interest, the owner representative, the contractor representative, they're presenting their, uh, their side regarding that issue to the dispute board. The dispute board retires 
they go and they discuss it amongst themselves and there will be a written opinion that is um, developed between the dispute board. That written opinion goes through the contract clauses, goes through what each party presented, um, goes through their opinion and the basis of their opinion that is provided to the parties and the parties can either accept or reject it. Um, if they reject it, they can continue negotiating about it. Um, if, you know, they reject it, they can go on. You know, that could be an issue that goes on to arbitration or litigation, depending upon the contract between the parties. Um, but it also is an opportunity for the parties to um, uh, continue negotiations and resolve it. We'll find that 95% of the time, the parties reach some sort of resolution on that. I do want to say that my first introduction to dispute boards was some 20 years ago when I was sitting as an administrative law judge. A case came before me that had a written DRB opinion. Um, I had never heard of dispute boards at that time. It was presented to me as a piece of evidence um, and I found it quite persuasive. I don't recall how I ruled in that case, but I do recall that when I read this dispute board opinion, it inspired me to go on to become a member of the dispute board foundation, to go through training and to become passionate about this process to resolve issues while the project is ongoing. So this is the Seattle Marion Oliver McCall um, project by LMN Architects um, in Seattle picture of that, they used a three member dispute board. And I wanted to just talk about best practices. Um, the contracts that can be developed, and I'm gonna talk a little bit later about contract specifications. Those contracts can provide that um, the opinions regarding the formal written uh, hearings regarding the dispute board are advisory, and non-binding, and that they are later admissible in an arbitration or litigation. When I told you that I was an administrative law judge with a project that was put before me um, regarding an opinion, um, that was an advisory opinion, it was non-binding, but there was a later arbitration and the written opinion was um, admissible. Um, there are some contracts that provide, I'm on one dispute board right now where it provides that any DRB opinion, written opinion, formal hearing opinion, up to a million dollars is binding um, and above a million dollars is non-binding. Um, I'm on another dispute board where it says that DRB opinions are not admissible in arbitration or litigation. So, you know, it depends on how the parties want to write it. But I'll just tell you that best practices that we have seen um, with the Dispute Resolution Board is that make the opinions advisory, non-binding, and later admissible. So we're looking at here the Pullman, the Bowler, gymnasium renovation project in Pullman, Washington. This is another Washington State University project. You know, just to show you some of the variety of projects that are working on this project had a three member dispute board and, re and ended um, on time, on budget with no disputes that went to arbitration or litigation. So the Seattle Safeco field of the Washington State University project really shows us some of the cost benefit analysis. Um, a DRB we have found that is under 0 0.05 to 0.15% of the entire budget for the project. As I mentioned before, projects, you know, usually in past times would end and then there'd be litigation, which would really increase the entire cost of the project that wasn't budgeted for. A DRB is something that is budgeted for and um, um, is a very small part of the budget, the overall budget. 
So another um, project in uh, Washington State is the Martin Stadium renovation project in Pullman. Again, this used a one-person project neutral to bring the project in on time, on budget, without resulting litigation. The Compton Union Building Pullivation um, in Compton Union Building Renovation in Pullman is another Washington State University project used a one-person project neutral that met monthly at the project and resolved all issues while the project was being completed. Um, really shows some of the benefits of using a dispute board, the open communication and collaboration. Um, Using a dispute board allows the parties to meet, you know, on that monthly basis with the dispute board and really collaborate um, to openly talk about issues and to get issues resolved, combining with a lot lower costs on the project. Another very large project that used a three-person dispute board is the Miami Performing Arts Center. It is a large project, but the DRB worked beautifully. Project finished on time and on budget. Using the DRB, there were no disputes um, at the end of the project. I want to talk a little bit about Department of Transportation. Um, across the United States, um, a big user of dispute boards are Department of Transportation. The Florida Department of Transportation, very similar to Caltrans, began using DRBs in 1994. Throughout the years, they've expanded the use of DRBs, and today, they pretty much use DRBs on every construction project. So if, this, if I was showing you a um, spreadsheet for a project in um, um, the stock market, you wouldn't be impressed with this sliding down scale of um, information. But the red actually is the time to complete the project and the green is the cost. This is showing um, FDOT's performance measures that the time to complete projects and the overall cost when using dispute boards from 1997 to 2018 has really decreased. So the Florida Department of Transportation um, is really committed to using DRB on every single project. Here's the Miami International Airport, which used a three-party DRB. Um, it is my information that the DRB for this project was actually brought on late and um, that there was already a lot of disputes when, the, when it was brought on and that it might not have been that successful. I'm on a, another project at this time that um, at the time they brought on the DRB, the project had been ongoing for almost three years, and there were almost there were over a hundred disputes that the parties had when they brought the DRB on. Fortunately, they were able to resolve all of the issues prior to um, the project uh, being completed um, with the the help of the DRB. So I want to talk a little bit about P3 projects. Um, P3, this is the Portsmouth Bypass Project, which is Ohio Department of Transportation. Um, this project used three DRBs, actually two technical, a design and construction DRB, and an operations and maintenance technical DRB, and one financial DRB. They were all non-binding, and they successfully, successfully completed this project ahead of schedule and within budget with only one dispute requiring a formal recommendation, and there was no resulting litigation on this project. So P3 DRB implementation, there's it's been used definitely a lot for transportation projects, over 45 P3 projects in the United States. 50% um, of these projects have had DRB provisions. Um, so I'm showing you a map, or a, not a map, but a diagram of uh, friction points for P3 projects between, you know, the owner, the concessionaire, the design builder, consultants, um, O and M operation. All of these areas, there can be um, conflicts, and that's why work. The dispute board foundation has a P3 task force 
We're constantly looking at these projects and trying to develop new concepts of how, you know, a dispute board can be used, whether it's a three dispute board or new ways of um, doing that. We actually have some uh, common specifications, you know, of, um, and recommendations regarding um, a stepped negotiation process for using DRBs on P3 projects, which are very complex and can last for a long time. The Portsmouth's project is 35 years. So the track record of DRBs, you know, it resolves 85 to 98 percent of all the matters do not go on to arbitration and litigation. It's highly successful. So I wanted to, since I marketed this talk about contracts, I wanted to present with you a list of some of the different contracts that are providing um, dispute board processes. Certainly the Federation of Consulting Engineers has, um, they have fully embraced around the world using um, dispute board um, processes. And I'm going to go, I'm going to finish in just a couple of minutes. And then if we have any questions, I'd be glad to answer any questions that come up. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you. So the AIA, CMAA, AGC, and then there are a number of organizations that have information on their websites about their standard contracts that um, and DRB provisions. Um, so I have, you know, 10 recommendations for specifications. You know, DRB members are neutral. Um, they serve both parties equally. Their fees and expenses are shared equally and start them at the beginning of the process. Um, they should regularly visit the site, advise on our advisory opinions during the process or formal disputes. And their informal but comprehensive, comprehensive hearings should be convened promptly. Um, DRB members are absolved from any personal or professional liability. Payment, usually DRB members are paid between 1,200 and 3,000 a day. They get paid for travel time and expenses, um, and they get paid for hourly work on the. I've already talked a little bit about the cost savings, you know, it reduces legal and consulting fees, um, accelerates communication, you know, benefits, talked a lot about these already, mutual resolution, positive relationships, open communication, trust and cooperation, early identification of issues, an impartial form forum, informal and rational basis for resolution, an extremely high resolution rate, reduces delay, better informed decision, and increases the number of bidders to ensuring a timely resolution of disputes. Contractors like DRBs, and you're going to increase the number of bidders, knowing that they're going to have an opportunity to resolve disputes while the project is ongoing. So kind of finally, the uh, dispute board takeaways from here. Um, the uh, pick good panel members. That's one of the main things that's important. Get a buy-in from all the parties. Start the meetings early, right when the project begins. Don't cancel or pro postpone meetings and site visits. Use the virtual Zoom meetings to, to have a meeting. Um, do site visits by... Uh, you know, photographs, videos, you know, don't wait for a dispute to arise. We find that dispute boards are ineffective if you they come to the meeting when there's already a lot of disputes already ahead. So be proactive. Why? This brings a lot of value to the clients. And finally, I do want to say that there is a dispute board manual, a guide for best practices and procedures on the website are the drb.org. This is a free download. You can also buy this at a number of um, online booksellers. Um, the, also, what you can find at drb.org, you can find uh, members of the drb.f, that um, members of the Dispute Board Foundation that are practitioners. You can find um, contract specifications. You can find a huge library of information 
And so I encourage everybody to go to the website to really look at that and review. Um, and just kind of one um, question that I have come up, you know, does a dispute board facilitate the parties trusting each other more? And I just want to say that, yes, it does facilitate the parties trusting each other, trusting each other that they're being open, that they're being honest, that, um, you know, you're going to have people who continue, who come to meetings, um, owners, contractor representatives that enjoy working with each other. The goal is to have the best project that they can have. And a dispute board only goes to help with that recommendation. Um, that's about it, everybody. You know, my um, email address, my phone number, please feel free to contact me. Please feel free to go to the Dispute Board Foundation website. And I really appreciate everybody coming and attending today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And I look forward to um, continuing the discussion about how dispute boards can benefit your projects in the healthcare industry and beyond um, to bring the projects in on budget and on time. I thank you so much for attending today. Appreciate it. Thank you.